Evolutionary.org presents Evolutionary Hardcore Podcast with your co-hosts, Steve from the American Underground and Mobster from the UK Iron Den. Get ready for the most hardcore and underground info in the industry. And here we go. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Evolutionary.org Hardcore Podcast Community, episode 146. PJ Braun, Steve Smee here, and the Moab stuff from across the pond. What's up, man? Morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are, start listening. We've got some hot stuff to do today. Yes, sir. So, PJ Braun, who is he? He's a 40 year old former national level bodybuilder. He's now a supplement company owner called Blackstone Labs. Very well known company out there. Very active on social media. Has a history of fighting the government to legalize some of the stimulant products. So we're going to talk about in this podcast, guys, we're going to talk about his history, what he's done, and give our opinions about what he used as a steroid cycle. So a little bit of background on him. He started working out when he was about 12, and he never got his pro bodybuilding card, even though he pushed hard to get it. He promised his parents while he was in college, if he was not a top five bodybuilder, he would no longer go after it, and he would just go ahead and switch to business. So he graduated from the University of Connecticut, exercise kinesiology. He loved weight training and he loved teaching others. So he wanted to get a degree in that. That was his passion. His last show was about nine years ago you, at the USA's. And then that's when a few weeks later he decided to start his own company and he named it Blackstone Labs. So Blackstone Labs, I'm going to bring in Mobster on this, talk a little bit about it. We're going to talk about DMA, explain this product that he made so much money on. We're gonna explain what it's all about. But he started Blackstone Labs out of a spare bedroom by himself. He did everything, he did the orders, he did the shipping, he did the social media, everything. And the first year he claims that he eclipsed 100,000 in sales. And then by year two, he was bringing in over a million. And then by the fifth year, they were doing 20 million in sales. So. By 2016, they were one of the fastest growing supplement companies in the United States. And the number one product that brought him great success was called DMAA. So we'll kind of get into DMA in a little bit. I'll bring in Mobster to talk a little bit about his thoughts so far. I, I, I'm kind of torn insofar as that uh, PJ starts off like a lot of us, you know, starting at 12. Steve Smee and I have probably started training, I think, together roughly around age 15, which, which we've mentioned previously. So this idea that PJ starts out as a body bunch of us like us, probably in a garage or a bedroom or, or whatever, and, and, you know, does the whole thing. So many of us have done that particular journey. Uh, the competitive stuff in my field, in Steve's, in Steve's field, and in PJ's field, we're all there, and we're competing. The, 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 the problem, such as it is, is that PG kind of... Uh, um, He's a kind of figure in what you might describe as the um, edgy side of the supplement business. I mean, for example, I mean, just Blackstone's not a problem, but labs. It's not a laboratory. It's a supplement company. It's not, not out there developing drugs and medical problems. So, I mean, I can think of a very well-known, very big brand, a bodybuilding company back in the day that every single advert, the guys would be wearing white coats. And sometimes it was bodybuilders in white coats. It was kind of ironic, but no, they 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 were trying to persuade you that it was like a, a laboratory and they're all chemists and and all that kind of stuff. So and then we get into and I I, I mentioned this in the uh, pre-show with Steve. I'm old enough and ugly enough, and I read some of the stuff and seen some of the stuff to know full well of the uh, little bit edgy things that companies were doing back in the day. And I'm thinking specifically of the rumors around a product called uh, Hot Stuff back in the day, where um, if rumors are to be believed, a powdered version of Dianabol or something similar was added to this particular drug, a, a supplement, a, along with a bunch of um, very nice ingredients at some expense in the first batch. The first batch goes out and immediately the reviews come back as this stuff is amazing. It's full of every single ingredient you could afford of, and a steroid. Lo and behold, the users are getting great results for vitamins, great results for energy, 
and putting on pounds and pounds of muscle. Second batch, third batch, not so hot, not so full of uh, powdered steroids and whatever else. But the reviews, the feedback on that first batch created the business. And this product was crazy selling for years. There's a bunch of other companies, even when the product's been on point, where as soon as the business grows to a certain level, the quality ingredients get cut back. A, a, a company will come in, a parent company, a, a, a buyout will occur, and they go, we can't afford to do this. There's hardly any margin. So they'll cut the good stuff out, and it becomes a poor product. PJ with the DMMA, and I'll let Steve address that specifically, although I'll, I'll, I'll put my um, opinion on that as well, kind of models that side of business. So you get products, and again, I could think of Kaspari, I mentioned in the pre-show, products that sound like steroids, but are not. Um, products that promise steroid-like results, but do not offer that. Products that contain ingredients that they know damn well the FDA is going to say, listen, if it's drug-like in any way, medium or form, we're going to smash the door down. We're going to go for your records. We're going to take stock off the shelf. And then you not only get that side of stuff, you also then get into the whole mudslinging when, it, when, when this kind of stuff occurs. So, yeah, I admire him for his work ethic. I, I, I like the fact that he started much like myself and probably every other of our listener out there grinding when he was 12, 13, 14 years of age. But I dislike this side of the supplement business because it seems like a three-year or five-year plan. Get in, maximize the amount of money I can, I can hand, potentially offer a risky product to people out there who don't always follow the instructions, might, might have issues with health, which taking product that contains DMMA might aggravate. Uh, and it's not to say the first time this has happened. I can think of these things going back to the 60s and 70s in, in bodybuilding supplement products. Um, it's not the only business that does that. And in fact, the uh, an amphetamine side of uh, dietary products for helping you lose weight has been probably going on since, since the war, since the Second World War with the soldiers. Uh, and this stuff used to be dished out like uh, sweets by doctors for women back in the day, the amphetamine stuff. So, but it, as Steve will get into, the potential for side effects, the potential for medical issues is huge. And knowingly doing that stuff, educating as we try to do with our podcast with the information on the forum, you go, okay, if I know that this has a health risk and I put it into my supplement and I keep putting it into my supplement until the FDA break down my door and raid me, that gives you a question about the kind of uh, morality and uh, business ethics of companies not just Blackstone, but a bunch of other companies out there that have tried to do this over the last 40, 50 years. Yeah, back to you, Steve. So um, let me explain a little bit about DMMA, and then uh, Mobster will come in and talk about kind of his battle with the FDA about this and, you know, and how he's trying to make it seem like it's a natural substance found in yeah. nature. And it's not. It's a, it's a very harsh stimulant. <clears throat> so DMAA, guys methyl hexanamine and it's an amphetamine derivative so we all know we've heard of amphetamines amphetamines used to be big back when they started coming around guys would you know guys and girls would use them a lot of business people it wasn't so much as many athletes as today but back in those days people would use them in business to stay up like they'd stay up like 20, 30 hours straight yep. to do some yep. type of business work. This was during the 80s when we had a business boom across. I know in the United States, I'm sure in uh, countries like Japan, they had a big business. But I don't know if it was like that in, over there on your side, Mobster. I'm pretty sure Europe had the same. Yeah. If I just jump in for a second there, the amphetamine, so funny that some part aspects of amphetamine, I'm thinking specifically if methamphetamine came out as a result, for example, of um, long distance bombing raids, uh, they were given to, pi by, to pilots and uh, both on the RAF in, here in the UK and the USAF back in the day for the bombing raids over Japan and for us in Germany because the plane, speed of the plane, the distances that were being flown, etc. Some of these flights were 11, 12 hours. And uh, in order for you to be focused enough to fly a bomb, a rather large bomb, specifically the atomic bomb, of course, but uh, the other long bombing, bombing raids and not have two or three crews on board, they would give these guys what amount of speed. 
Um, and, and in fact, there was a whole, there's books written on the whole, that side of thing. And there was the idea that the Nazis were giving them methamphetamine. No, we all was. We was all giving our bomber crews speed and methamphetamine and, and drugs like this. So it's come all the way from then. And as in the 60s, of course, people were taking speed because, you know, they were taking a bunch of drugs. They were testing what was available with the LSD and everything else and mushrooms and stuff like that. And as Steve said, it was as it was pretty much normal for women to go to the doctors to use this to, to lose weight and to get that little bit of fat off and without dieting, of course. And as he says, businessmen, probably more than than athletes, as Steve said, that came later on. At the time, so this was like your mum might have taken it back in the day. Your dad might have used it when he was working hard at building up his business, more than 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 your local sprinters and and your local athletic crew and whatever else. So yeah, it's it's surprising. Now, of course, I mean, we've only got to look at meth heads. We've only got to look at people that you know were speed freaks. And <laughs> trust me, they're they're not pleasant, sociable company when they're when they're on one. <laughs> that's that's without getting into the coke and God knows what else people can do. Speed freaks talking a million miles an hour and trying to make coherent sense of what they're doing. And you're sitting there stone cold, so with no drugs in your system going, we're going to get rid of this person and get my normal stuff done. And the idea that we can imagine our mums using this as a dietary product because they could go to the doctors back in the day is kind of like, what the hell? And, but we're getting, as Steve wants to address the, the health risk is, that's, that's the thing. That's the reason why, of course, they, the doctors stopped writing the script. That's the reason why businessmen stopped using them back in the day. And, and went in different directions. Like, what about the health state, the risk? Well, here's the thing. If you fast forward to the 2010s, it really got out of control with guys, the energy drinks, the stimulants, pre-workouts, supplement companies knew they can shove pre-workouts down companies, then that, down their customers' throat. They got the guys who were late teens, early 20s hooked on these things. So when you take DMMA, pre-workout i've seen guys take this shit and work mm. out they're sweating they're going 100 miles an hour like crazy i mean they look like they're something mentally wrong with them when they're working out so i understand why guys they they try it and they're like holy shit my workouts are amazing you feel euphoric you feel energetic even if you slept like shit the night before even if you didn't eat good whatever you're still going in there and you're going crazy but guys there's a downside you're it's going to strain the crap out of your organs specifically your heart you're going to have a hard time breathing you're going to be sweating buckets um, your lungs are going to be under serious strain so even a small dosage of this stuff 50 milligrams can cause your heart rate to rapidly go up your heart rate is going to be up so much and while you're exercising your heart rate's going to go up even further and you're going to be hitting your maximum heart rate with less effort. So it makes no sense from a physical standpoint to use DMMA before a workout because it's not helping you. It's actually hurting you. You're going to be able to, to go less of a distance on it. You're going to be able to boost your heart rate less because of it because it's making your heart beat so much faster. So you're going to basically burn out your heart on this stuff. Go ahead, Monster. Yep. There's, there's a couple of things that occurred to me. In a pre-show, I said to Steve, I, I, I'm a big-time bodybuilding magazine collector and I have been for a long time, probably for 40-something years, nearly as long as I've been training. The last five or six years, and the muscular development is the magazine that sticks in my mind, and I'm not blaming the magazine themselves, but they're advertising, companies that advertise in muscular development, specifically, typically, the first 30 or 40 pages when the magazine was up around the 400-page per issue at level. And they would have probably a dozen companies pushing uh, pre-workout products and every single pre-workout company or product would claim to be the, the most hardcore, Steve, the strongest pre-workout there is. And you go, okay, how is it that every single company can claim that? They can't. They, the, and, the, and, and most of them contain high levels of caffeine but none of them will pretty much, I think, you know, you're talking about between two and 400 milligrams. So again, they can't be the strongest unless they go five or 600. So what they started to do is they started to look for edgy products, edgy ingredients that they can add to their product. And you get stuff like that, whether it is some sort of new kind of carbohydrate, uh, a different form of caffeine, 
and then you get into products like DMAA. I mean, something else that occurs to me, Steve, is if you've got, and we've mentioned this and stuff on the forum, any kind of anxiety issues, and you take what is essentially a borderline issue causing amount of a pre-workout, that's, that's the thing right there. If you've got anxiety, if you're the kind of person that starts to get breathless around certain situations, and then I give you a massive dose of anxiety like causing stim. And then you've got stuff like, and, and seeing this with products, uh, very, very bad products like DMP, of course, where um, overweight users or unhealthy users or users with pre existing medical conditions won't take any kind of sort, pay any kind of attention to the doses. So let's say that a company like Blackstone knows that it's an edgy product, knows that it's a hardcore. And so they, they're not stupid. They make sure that on the side of the tub it says, oh, use one scoop, 50 milligrams of DMMA, whatever. There are always going to be people that use two scoops. There's always going to be someone out there that's going to double up because they're that desperate to lose weight. And you go, right, so you've gone from something that's going to cause people to freak out and have breathless and, and have their heart racing, and you've doubled up. So you get stuff like that all the time. And this is the sort of thing with the FDA for, well, FDA, for all their shortcomings and their failings, understand we're not necessarily protecting the fit and healthy, we're protecting the unhealthy and the unfit and the kind of people that should have listened to the, the, the advisory, but doubled up, should have listened to the advisory and stayed on. And I know one of the things that Steve and I talk about, again, on the forums, right? If, you, if you've done a day's work and you go to the gym at five or six o'clock at night and you're taking these kind of products, how the hell are you going to go to sleep, Steve, when it's still in your system four hours later? You're still wired. And then it kind of almost is like drug-like, uh, I can't take something unless I'm high. That's sometimes how this, this, you say euphoric, you mentioned euphoric. And lots of companies even, I think there's even actually a, company, a product called Euphoria. This idea that you need to be high or on some special plane to train is just crazy. And then what's the, guys, let's say, imagine that you get a product like that that's really, really good for you, really, really good. You feel amazing, you're pumped, you're having a hell of a workout, and every time you go, at some point, your body gets used to it. There's, there's, there's weight, there's, there's measures in your body that goes, okay, I can't keep producing this level of dopamine, I can't keep giving you this level of energy. It, you back off. So what do you do? You either up the dose with more, more potential medical risk, or do you find an even more hardcore product? You go out there and think you can train on meth. Go out there and think you can train on DMP. You go out there and think like people were doing back in the day with DMP, where they, they, were, they were running this thing where they were saying, oh, it helped me get through the workout. Of course it helped get through the workout. It was a derivative of freaking dynamite, for crying out loud. What are you going to take next? Rocket fuel? Drink petrol out of a tank? Come on, guys. You need to go to the gym with food in your system. If, and I know Steve's not a big fan of this, if you've got to take something, have a frigging glass of coffee. But even then, I don't train in the afternoon. If I drink coffee late in the day, I'm gonna be awake all night. I make sure my last cup of coffee is at four o'clock. Guys, if you need to be stimmed, kind of high, with your heart racing, breathless, there's something the matter with your training. Even if it's just making sure that you have something to eat late in the afternoon when you're at work, so that when you do hit the gym, that's the way to do it. Don't wait till you leave the leave work, leave school, leave college, whatever, and then grab something to eat then and think that food's going to be your system for energy. So that, there's all these kind of issues there, Steve. And part of the problem, possibly part of the problem, is that the great and vast majority of people that go to the gym, that the kind of people that we'll be talking to, are 18 to 25 years of age. When you're older, you should have some experience. You should have some knowledge. You should be able to apply yourself in a certain particular way. So the younger guys, they, they, they're looking for an edge and uh, products of the type that we're talking about with DMMA in kind of offer that to them. And they're more willing to take that particular risk or whatever else. We're older guys. We see things differently. And of course, we've made these mistakes. I've had stuff sent to me when I had my little magazine back in the day that made my hand shake. I took it one time, man. I can't imagine taking it every time I go to the gym. What the hell? <laughs> back to you. Yeah, so guys, you know, these pre-workouts, we're seeing so many guys, they do these energy drinks, they think they need something, and mobs are covered at all. At the end of the day, really, all you really need to do is be hydrated to go on the work. I like to work out fasted. I don't have food. I don't have, um, like, tonight I'm going to do a workout. 
Um, and I'm going to eat a meal for lunch and then have a little snack about two to three hours before my workout. Yeah. So I'm going to go into my workout with nothing. If you're a power lifter, it's going to be a little different. If you're like mobster, you power lift, you're going to want a little more food. You want your body to, to kind of go after those, those carbs, those sugars from, from that meal. But if you're, gotcha. you know, training for a normal, you don't, you don't need anything the whole day to, to do it, but I'm having a really hard workout. And then tomorrow I'm doing a triathlon um, around mid midday. And what I'm going to do for that triathlon is I'll make sure I'm going to wake up. I'm going to take, I'm going to drink two big glasses of water with electrolytes in them because it's going to be hot and I'm not going to eat anything. I'm not going to eat anything. And then I'm going to do my triathlon. I'm going to drive to the grocery store. I'm going to get uh, food for my meal, come home, cook it. And then I'm going to eat about an hour later. So that's, that's what I like to do. You want your body to have, you want your body to learn to train without the need for anything. Okay. That's, that's what you want to do. If you start taking these pre-workouts, the MMA and all this stuff, you're going to be dependent on it. And it's very hard habit to kick and it's not helping you during your workout. That's the problem. A lot of guys say, Oh, Steve, what does it matter? If it's not good for me, whatever it's helping me work. It's not helping you in your workout. It's like revving up your car engine before a race, you're burning out your car engine. And then over the long term, you're going to start losing sleep you're going to be losing sleep you're going to be losing your heart uh, is going to get weaker your lungs are going to get weaker it's not going to be good it's not going to help you so do not start taking these pre-workouts guys and if you are taking them you have to wean yourself off off of them it's very very hard guys and i don't take any stimulants at all i don't drink coffee none of that shit and if I were to drink coffee, which I have maybe like once or twice the past year, I had a couple sips of coffee. My heart rate was crazy. Like I, my heart rate was beating like crazy. I'm like, holy shit, this is crazy. Cause I'm not used to taking these stimulants. The more you yeah. take the stimulants, the more your body adapts and the more you're going to need to take them. So all these guys who got hooked on this DMMA mobster, yeah. once it was banned and once they couldn't get it anymore, they were screwed. They come back. They were yeah. screwed. So then they had to go start taking like five Red Bulls and drink five cups of coffee and take all these stimulant pre warnings just to make up for it. So they got so addicted to it. That's what's happened. So there's really no no upside to taking this shit. So I'll let Mobster finish up with the uh, battle with the FDA and their current issues. Him and Jared Wee, PJ Braun and Jared Wee have been still fighting the FDA. If you're making millions of dollars on something and you know, I didn't get a chance to mention this. I'll have to earlier. give it up, man. I'll have to give it up. I'll bring Mobster in a second, but I have to also add that um, there was uh, the blah, blah, blah. it was first introduced in sports and bodybuilding by Patrick Arnold in 2006 under the trademark name of Geranium. Geranamine. Geranamine. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. But here's the thing with it they brought it as a natural supplement found in nature, but we know. Yeah. That it's not naturally found in nature. It is a fucking drug. It is a fucking chemical. All right. So it is not naturally found in nature. So you cannot sell this as a dietary supplement as it's not found in nature. It's not like taking Fidogia or milk thistle, which are plants found in nature. No, this is a legitimate drug, synthetic drug that was produced. So they're trying to pretend that it's a real supplement found in nature like you can go into the woods and pick it up off the ground mom so <laughs> that's what they want you to think but it's not so this stuff yeah, yeah. yeah this stuff is bad news so talk about the battle of fea and then we'll kind of talk about a steroid use i, I was gonna say this and if it's found in nature so are rocks but we're not grinding them up and putting them into supplement it's, it's bullshit if it was something you scraped off a flower and you could make it with a mortar and pestle, maybe, right? But what is the reality of this stuff? In order to isolate these things and get a, a, a reasonable amount of whatever else, it's a chemical process, whether it's distillation, it's whatever, right? So it's, it, you're, you're, being, you're getting into semantics. If you say it's found in nature, so are rocks, so is dirt, so is the water in the sea. But we're not taking those and putting them into bottles and saying it's a border bodybuilder supplement. So that's bullshit. If you've got to take this rock, or this plant or whatever, and you've got to grind it down and then scrape off the stuff that's no good and push that to one side and do that with kilos of kilos of kilos of kilos of stuff to get a few grams or something. And then you've got to chemically treat it. How and, and then you've got to put me put it in a pressure vessel and then you've got to distill it or something like that. And all that, and you've got to do like, like 100 kilos of geranium 
petals or leaves or buds or whatever the hell it is to produce like 10 grams of something. Right? Maybe you can use something that's left over from the residue for something else. I know fertilizer or whatever else, but you're producing it. And, and then you know damn well that it is an amphetamine-like product that is getting as far away from nature as it's possible to do short of having it be delivered by a spaceship. I mean, come on, guys. The other thing I never said with regards to the FDA raid, I touched on it earlier on, quite simply, the, the FDA has a bunch of issues that we could go into in regards of certain restrictions and their ideas about things. And sometimes they can be politically motivated and directed by various different authorities outside of the FDA. And if something's in the media and we're going to go and act on this, you need to protect the American public or, or the British. You know, we've got a similar organisation here in the UK, of course, the Medical Controls Agency. Uh, uh, you know, and this stuff like, for example, we had stuff over in the UK where if it was in a pill, you got charged VAT and it wasn't in a pill, it was a powder, you didn't. Because they said if it was a pill, it was like a medicine. It's the same damn thing. And you had to pay a tax on it. Or, or, or we had stuff where I, I, my own supplement company, which wasn't using these kind of products, every single supplement company in the UK got a warning letter telling them you couldn't use this, you couldn't use that. And it was very, very similar to the MMA again. So that's that kind of stuff. I, I, I understand sometimes the need for it, and I touched on it earlier on. Equally, uh, the idea, um, and I mentioned this to Steve in the pre-show, some scientists think, and I suspect my gut feelings that PJ might be guilty of this, having the FDA raid you is almost like a sign that your company's hardcore. It's almost like you're edgy and you're out there, and some guys go crazy for that. I can't remember the name of the product, Jacked, jacked free. I couldn't, I couldn't remember when we were talking the other day, Steve. So if you go on eBay, you're going to find, and I hope they're original, but it can easily be copies, so-called original products jacked free with the banned ingredients still in it. So, so someone's found one in their cupboard that's four years old, 10 years old, whatever, and, and uh, you can buy it. And then for absolutely ages, of course, jacked free had to take the banned ingredient out and so they would go, oh, it's a new, better, more improved formula. Really, the stuff that people are going crazy from with the brand ingredient sold like hotcakes. The stuff that hasn't got the brand ingredient might not sell so well. So then we get into marketing. And I actually used to go and eBay and find people trying to sell these tubs for double or triple the price because they had one in the cupboard they hadn't used or they'd only used a little bit. And they wanted to sell it to someone else who wanted to be steamed off their nuts so they can go to the gym. So you get into all of that kind of stuff. And as I said to Steve, it's kind of almost like a marketing thing to, to, to put yourself with a drug-like name, to put a drug-like ingredient into your product, to be raided by the FDA. is almost like a badge of honour. The us, we're hardcore. The, the police came with the FDA. They broke down our door. They took all their records away. We're so edgy. You should buy our stuff. So that, that's kind of annoying. So you've got that aspect to it as well. I, I'm, I'm a big agreement with Steve, and we're probably one of the... <laughs> We're probably only two mods on the forum that are not fans of free workouts. I do enjoy my coffee far more than Steve does, but I I, I, I can't be doing with pre. I've I've got tubs of pre workout here that were given to me, and I wouldn't I I, I should bin them off. I couldn't tell you how many years old they are, Steve, uh, uh, and they're very well known brands. And I should probably just get rid of them instead of just leaving them on my supplement shop, man. It's just like what the hell. So yeah, I mean, let's take away for this, guys. You don't need to be using stims. Pre-workouts have their place. Uh, if I was going to use a product like that, I might use it on a day of a competition when I want an edge. But for every single workout, all the damn time, no. Uh, I mean, I, as Steve says about the strongman side of things, carbs, yeah, flapjacks, that kind of stuff. When I was working a full-time job, I'd make sure to have something at four o'clock and I'd be in the gym at seven. So I've got myself three or 400 calories coming into my system, ready to rock and roll when I hit the gym. If I train as I do here in the mornings, kind of half retired, I don't know what you call what I do. Uh, I like to have two hours between getting up and eating and hitting the gym. It's, it's about two hours by the time I've eaten and by the time I get here. And I'm only operating on a bowl of cereal or something like that for breakfast when I go to the gym. You, and not only that, Stephen knows, Steve knows this as well as what I do. Your body will adapt, people. Yeah, the first time you go hungry or faster to the gym, you'll be, oh my God, I was dragging my ass. It was awful. I need to get stimmed. No, you don't need to get stimmed. Just give it two or three sessions. The second or third or fourth session will be easier than the first one because your body's got used to it. There's been times, Steve, when I've trained, when I haven't been able to do certain things, and my, my, I, to, to coin a phrase, to put it crudely, my ass has been hanging out all the way to the gym door. And then once I went into the gym, boom, 
there was the energy that I needed to do the stuff that I needed to do. It's like my body was saving this energy up just to go into the gym and smash the weights and do what I needed to do. My body had adapted. I didn't need carbs two hours before. I could go hungry. There's plenty of glycogen. I was functioning perfectly well. Why can't I function when I go to the gym? Guys, hydration. Steve's touched on this already. Food when you get indoors and all that kind of stuff. You'd be surprised. Listen, if, it, if our bodies can adapt and do some of the things that need to be done in the gym, as a human race, we would have died out a long ass time ago because if we couldn't function on empty, if we couldn't function and do crazy stuff, every time there was an emergency, we would have died. Every time an animal came and took with horns ran towards us, we wouldn't have the energy to run away. Every time we were hungry and we needed to go hunting, we would have starved because we wouldn't have had the energy to go to those things. And that's life or death stuff. It would not go in a way or press it and dumbbell or whatever. So your bodies can adapt and do lots of these kind of things. Arguably, most of us are not going to be super athletes or, or champions or whatever else. We just go to the gym because we want to look good, be in shape and whatever else. So we don't need that one-tenth of one percent edge to what we're doing in the gym in order to go out there and perform at some superhuman level because we're not superhuman. We're not champions. And as I say, you will adapt. You will overcome. I want you to go and destroy the weights, but you don't need to be hired to do it. Let's get into um, PJ's cycle and, and uh, his experience as a competitive bodybuilder and the things he would have, he would have needed to do to try and get that. Why don't you, uh, yeah, tell the guys what he's doing now, his stats now, and what, what's, what, you know, tell them a little bit about that. I said, as a, they've, funny enough, and, and, and I mentioned this in a post show on the last podcast where Steve and I were talking about what we were going to talk about today. PJ's just started doing a column in Muscular Development. And in fact, he features in his own advert with very muscular uh, toned physique. And, and uh, although that picture is a couple of years old because I've seen it before, he keeps himself in good shape. And, and like his uh, former business partner, Aaron Singerman, they've both got gyms, I believe, on the premises that they own for either the, both Blackstone and Record One. They've both got gyms there to train. Now, of course, he trained as a competitive bodybuilder. He's been, I believe, uh, from your uh, previous podcast interview, he was a prep coach for women. He found him very easy to work with and uh, enjoyed it enormously. And it's only when, as Steve said, he decided to go from um, not getting a pro card over to the supplement thing that they become a much bigger focus. And in fact, he said, I believe in your, your uh, 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 evolutionary radio uh, episode 204, if he'd, uh, if one, he would actually consider carrying on with the idea of being a prep coach and that kind of stuff. He's still walking around, I believe, at something like 230, 240 pounds. And any interview that you see him do, video that you see him do, he looks like a toned, tan, muscular fella. So he's definitely still training. That's definitely still part of him. And even when he was doing absolutely crazy stuff, and he talked about in your, in your podcast and in other interviews, he was uh, probably as crazy borderline alcoholic as it's possible to be when he had his head well up his ass and was going for some serious crap at the time and turned up in hospital with some crazy high uh, alcohol uh, blood content. Training was the one thing that kept him kind of sane and kept him grounded. And, and, and the sheer ability for him to be able to work out at that time is what probably kept him out of um, needs and surgery and some major, major medical issues that he would have had. So the simple fact that he lifted and worked out and whatever else stopped the alcohol absolutely tearing him up and potentially, you know, putting him into a coma and stuff like that because the alcohol can't be had on that particular visit I'm thinking of. So there's the tra training stuff. He is not, he knows and he understands he has not got the potential to be a top professional bodybuilder. But if you as an average Joe walking down the street and PJ was coming in the other direction with a vest top on, you'd know that this guy trained. He's definitely a, a someone with a V taper, with good arms, good muscular physique, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. As I said, right at the beginning of the podcast, I like that aspect of him. I like, there's a lot of supplement company owners that you wouldn't know owned a supplement company, Steve, or, or, or did make created products for bodybuilders. There, there are a few, and we get to see them. Aaron Singerman at Redcon 1, uh, the, the fella that makes the Cardillo belts, puts out a bunch of Instagram videos of him doing crazy stuff with ice and water tanks and whatever else. Um, Jay Cutler with Gut Cutler Nutrition, of course, is a former Mr. O. 
these guys look like they train, look like they use their products, look like they're doing what needs to be done. But as I know here in the UK, I can think of two or three big name company owners here or former company owners here. But you wouldn't know that they trained. You wouldn't know that they worked out. You would certainly wouldn't know that they were producing body wooden products. So PJ at that at least exemplifies the guy that trains and is producing products for him. If he was a customer, this is the kind of products that he'd want to have. If we get into this, the steroid stuff here, especially when we believe he was training to try and get his pro card, um, it's going to be, I think, a little bit like some of our forum, forum members, Stephen, some of our listeners, where they sometimes try to use pro-level amounts of drugs to create a pro-level physique. And as, as PJ appreciates, it doesn't always work like that. So, for example, the suggested cycle that we think that he would have used back in those days would have been something like 1,200 million grams of equipoise EQ per week, 1,000 milligrams a week of trin acetate, 800 milligrams of test prop. Now, those, those three drugs right there, and I'll let Steve take over the others, those three drugs right there, that's three grams. Three grams of some form of testosterone going into your system, and you're not going to become Mr. Olympia. I, I can think of, again, a few faces here in the UK that have used those kind of drugs where we also know champion bodybuilders, guys that are Olympia quality, will be in the Olympia lineup, have been in the Olympia lineup back in the day and in more recent times. And just these first three drugs coming to three grams will probably be triple what they were taking. I mean, I'm looking at these three drugs here, Steve. That, that's the sort of level that might have been used by Dorian Yates at his absolute biggest. And Dorian was a, a six-time winner. I'm thinking of Dorian on stage at 270 pounds, ripped 310 pounds in the off-season. And those, three, those first three drugs might have been the competitive cycle that he took on his run to, to the Mr. Olympia wins when he was at his absolute best. And that's without getting into the other drugs. You've got to remember, people, this is what we're talking about. Maybe he thinks, and he's not the only bodybuilder that would have done this, if I do Olympia-level type cuts of drugs, I'm going to create an Olympia-level physique, or it better. Because I haven't got Olympia level genetics, I need to use more drugs in order to match the genetic advantage that these guys have had. Unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. One of the genetic advantages that top pro bodybuilders have is their affinity to use drugs and to get the most from drugs and receptor uptake and, and, and having the, the, the genetic response to drugs, the genetic response to be able to assimilate four, five thousand, six thousand calories a day worth of food, 600 grams of protein. That is a genetic aspect. It's not just the muscle and the ability to train in the gym. It's all of these aspects, which includes how to use and the, uh, the, the, the natural testosterone levels, what their testosterone levels are like when they come off drugs, all of those kind of things. Steve, do you want to touch on the rest of the drugs for us? Yes, sir. So let's do it, guys. So the next one, Anadrol, very, very popular, especially when he was competing mid, you know, five, 10 years ago, he was trying to get hit his peak, 100 milligrams a day of Anadrol, usually a dosage, 50 milligrams a day for a normal person. Gosh, I ran it at 25 milligrams a day and it blowed me up like a bolt, like, like crazy. I mean, this stuff is incredible. So 100 milligrams a day, very, very possible. It's a DHT derivative that has those benefits. It binds to estrogen receptors. That is the risk that it has. That's, that's a side effect you have to watch out for when you're trying to look good. Also has tremendous amount of side effects, really hard on the liver. The next one, Anovar, 125 milligrams a day. Anovar, it's good for hardening. It's good. It's got some, it's very good for cutting. That's one that's very popular. If you can find the real stuff. It's a great steroid, but it's extremely expensive. In HGH, you want to get big, you want to get size. The whole HGH insulin stack is, is necessary if you want to take things to the next level. HGH, eight IUs a day, it's expensive, but PJ's got the money. He's got the money. He doesn't care. Mm. Someone like him, they, they spend money on HGH, no problem. Now, when you take that much HGH, you got to take some insulin with it, get your blood sugar back down. So they'll take the insulin and then they'll basically eat their meal. And then the meal will get shuttled into their muscles. You're going to grow mass. So this entire stack, very androgenic. 
It's got a DHT derivative. It's got, it's got a couple mild compounds in there. It's got cutters in there. So this is something that bodybuilders five, 10 years ago were all over. And then, you know, we go back to the trend when Mobster mentioned Trembolone. You've got to have it in there. You've got to. Without Trembolone, you're not going to be able to stay with your competitors at that level because everyone's taking it. It's the king of steroids. It's going to give you the most strength and mass and size and it does what hgh and insulin does it's a great nutrient partitioner i mean it will suck everything out of your body and shuttle it into your muscles so it raises insulin re uh, resistance and lowers insulin sensitivity when you're on it and that's a good thing when you're trying to build mass that means you can basically eat a lot of food and put on a lot of size because that's that's what it's great at so if you run at a high dosage it's crazy good it's crazy good for I me mean, for me just running 200 milligrams a week a trend with nothing else turns me in within three or four weeks even with an e ester nfa ester turns me into a freak in like four weeks i mean i gain six seven eight pounds that fast on this stuff so can you can imagine running a thousand milligrams a week and running EQ and running testosterone and running Anadrol mm -hmm. and Anavar and HGH and insulin. That's what she, that's what these guys are doing at this level and more and more. So yeah, it's a tremendous cycle. If you just want to build size, don't try this at home guys. It's very expensive and it's very harsh on your liver, your kidneys, your heart, your organs, your prostate on and on and your head hair and everything. And it wouldn't surprise me too, if you know you could shuffle in some winstrol and masteron into this masteron to harden and winstrol to dry so wouldn't it surprise me if they they these guys masteron propane and some winstrol here and there especially ahead of the show to really touch things up so finish up the show mobster with your final thoughts and then get in and then uh, do the disclaimer and we'll, uh, we'll be good to go i got i think it with pj pj himself has admitted in the podcast that he did with steve me that uh you can't he said himself, you can't take a bunch of drugs or more drugs than this and expect to become Mr. Olympia. Exactly what I was saying a few minutes ago, and PJ Sells has said that. I'd also consider uh, how he felt on this cycle. And that's just from what we're suggesting here. There may have been other drugs in and out of it. You're talking about a guy that's very driven uh, in order to succeed in his company. He's, he's wired that way. He's motivated that way. This is a guy that's got a five, ten year plan, you know, double up in year two, double up in year three. This is a guy we talked about with, with regards to the, the ingredient that we were discussing earlier on. That's probably going to be thinking about his company 15, 16, 17 hours a day. And in fact, again, in the podcast, he talks about how, you know, his, he was consumed with being driven to succeed with the company. And I suspect that this is probably some, he's probably in this wired this particular way all the time. If you're wired like PJs, if you're driven in that particular way, if you was, and, and I want to be king of the world at doing certain particular things, regardless of what level of business you're in, but specifically in the bodybuilding uh, business, then can you imagine what it would have been like being on cycle like this as well, Steve, had he been a businessman at the same time and not just competing? So I can see him being a driven bodybuilder and a driven a, a driven businessman. If he'd have been on these drugs or using any of the stimulants that we're talking about while he was uh, trying, driving his business before, because fortunately this is, we're talking about a cycle that he took before, it, it would have been a head messer specifically and of course in, infamously with regards to the trip so yeah i mean the other stuff i mean i just think looking at the list again here steve the the, the anadrol 100 milligrams a day uh this, that would be a kind of almost almost sensible cycle for some users on its own which is 700 milligrams a week but it's such a watery drug so some of the drugs that we need to keep him dry and muscular as a bodybuilder and again when he was competing and other drugs are just there for the keeping the mass on him and keeping the muscle and whatever else. And again, we're talking about, I mean, for me, again, some of these things here, Steve, it's just a sheer amount of pinning. Uh, daily injections, multiple daily injections, specifically with regards to the insulin and, and to a lesser degree with regards to the human, human growth hormone. Guys, if you're going to do that, rotate your sights, do things probably 100%. We've got a post that I just addressed this morning on the forum about a guy saying, what happens if I bend a needle when I'm drawing up? Should I? Well, no, take that pin off, bin it, and use another one to inject. 
What about the scar tissue dam? Oh, well, the hell are you still injecting in the same damn place? Yet you're building up scar tissue. Now, that's that's just a, a, an occasional user. If you're injecting this amount of steroid, as we suspect PJ would have been back in the day, if it's multiple injections per day, even if it's subcutaneously, just underneath the skin there, do things properly, rotate your sites, don't keep injecting in the same damn spot and expecting not to get scar tissue or issues or whatever else. Pins and syringes are cheapest. They're pennies, pennies, and they're still pennies now. Go out and buy them, get them properly, dispose of them properly, rotate your damn sites, do things clean and hygienically. Right, I will address the disclaimer. As always on any of these podcasts, we're not doctors and the opinions that we produce for this podcast are our own. There are our views and they are based on experience and views that we have on the topic. Our podcasts are for informational and educational entertainment purposes only. The freedom of speech and the First Amendment rule applies. Thank you. All right, guys. So next week, you want to give a little uh, primer of, of who we're doing next week, buddy? You'll have to remind me. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't got no notes today. I do apologize, listeners. I do apologize. All right, guys. So, all right. So we're doing a guy who's classic bodybuilder guys. Um, well, not too, not from mobsters days classic, but for, for a lot of you young guys, but he, he passed away um, a while back and he's one of the bigger motherfuckers out there. So mobs are going to have fun with that one. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> okay. Now you remember. remember who it is. All right. You want to get one? Huge, huge Canadian beast. Unfortunately, right. it's past the white people, but yeah, I know who it is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think that hint probably, I think a percentage huge. of our listeners know who, who we're talking about on that one, but you guys yeah. will listen to the next The biggest. Week. So we'll talk to you guys then. Have a good one, guys. Take care.